Grandad's nighttime visits started when I was 13 years old. This was a few years ago now, but it only stopped fairly recently, and I still remember the first time it happened. It was the middle of the school holidays, and my mum was ill. Mum being ill wasn't something that bothered me too much at the time. It was a pretty common occurrence, something I was even used to by then. Every month, it would happen the same way. Dad would come into my room and tell me Mum wasn't feeling so good and that she'd have to go away for a while until she felt better. Then, he'd drive off with her in his car and collect her a few days later. I never knew where she went. Never knew what was wrong with her, either. Sometimes she'd come home with scratches up her arms, but apart from that... I never saw any other symptoms. When dad went off to collect her, I'd wait by the door for them to come back. I'd wait for her to reappear and scoop me up into her arms. I missed you, cubby, she'd always say, planting kisses over my face. I love you so, so much. My name's James, but as long as I can remember, mum's always called me cubby. It's her nickname for me. Every month was the same routine. Mom getting ill, going away for a bit, then coming back as if nothing was wrong. But the summer I turned 13, things changed. The routine changed. Because that was the first time I started going to stay at Grandad's. My granddad is a large man with a white beard and a shaved head. He's from Sheffield originally, and he still has this deep, gruff northern accent. Communicates mainly in grunts. Lives on his own at the edge of the new forest in an old ramshackle cottage. We hardly ever saw him when I was little, and when we did, I always dreaded the visits. He scared me. I wasn't scared of him by the time I was 13 though, or at least that's what I told myself. No, the reason I protested when dad told me I'd be staying with granddad this time while mom got better was because I didn't want to leave the house. I wanted to stay near my friends. The kids I knew in the village would be out climbing trees and going on bike rides. If I was cooped up in granddad's cottage, I'd be missing out. Dad was having none of it though. He wouldn't give me a reason why I had to go or respond to my protests. Just told me it would be good for me to spend time with Grandad. Then he bundled me into the car and we left. 45 minutes later, I was standing on the doorstep of Grandad's cottage, raising my hand to knock. Dad had already driven off. I was trying to tell myself. I wasn't a little kid anymore, and there was nothing to be scared of. But as the cottage door creaked open, and Grandad's large shadow fell over me, I couldn't stop my heart from beating a little harder in my chest. Grandad's cottage was old. The ceilings were low, and the furniture was minimal. The carpets were moth eaten, ancient things that seemed to kick up tiny clouds of dust whenever you put a foot on them. The bathroom had black mold rising up the wallpaper. The paper itself was damp and flaking, and had peeled away to the stone in some areas. Entering the room felt like stepping into a cave. My bedroom wasn't much better. It was right at the back of the house, and it had only three pieces of furniture, an oak chest of drawers, a dilapidated wardrobe, and a single bed in the corner. I remember my heart sinking the minute I set eyes on it. Oddly, even though I can picture Grandad's house clearly enough, I don't remember much about how I spent my days there, especially during that first visit. I think we mainly kept out of each other's way. Grandad would be in the lounge watching TV or reading, and I'd be in my room on my phone, making the most of the one bar of 4G I could find in the cottage. 
I can't remember if we spoke to each other much, or what we said if we did. Mostly, it's a blur. What I do remember are the nights. The first night in particular. I told Grandad I was tired and that I was going to head to bed early. He grunted something in response. Then, I spent a bit of time in my room on Snapchat and YouTube, the videos taking painfully long to load, before heading to sleep. I woke sometime later in the night. The cottage was silent around me. I could hear the leaves of the birch tree rustling in the wind in the back garden. But that was all. Moonlight spilled through a gap in the curtains. I leaned over to check my phone and saw that the time was a little after 2am. For some reason, I felt wide awake. My heart was beating hard in my chest and a film of sweat coated my forehead. As if I'd woken suddenly from a nightmare. But if I had, I couldn't remember it. I tried to relax, tried to lie back and let sleep wash over me again. But in Grandad's cottage, relaxing wasn't an easy thing to do. At first, I'd only been able to hear the trees outside the window. But as I lay there on the pillow, staring into the darkness, I began to hear other noises too. The soft creak of a floorboard, faint taps, a distant rattling, which I assumed had to be the pipes in the wall, and other sounds as well. Sounds I found harder to place. At one point, I heard something that sounded like a faint snuffling noise coming from the back garden. Some kind of animal. But when I sat up in bed and strained my ears, all I could hear was the wind. Get a grip, I told myself. You're 13 years old, not a little kid anymore. It was easier said than done, but I managed it eventually. I don't know how long I lay in the dark for, but after a while, tiredness finally got the better of me. My mind began to settle. I felt myself slowly drifting off, only to jerk suddenly awake again when I heard a noise outside my room. A soft, deliberate creak loud and clear in the darkness. I turned over in bed, trying not to make a sound. My heart hammered in my chest. I pulled the covers down from my face slightly, positioning myself so I could peek over them, so I could see the bedroom door. And as I stared at it, feeling like I was five years old again, I saw the handle begin to turn. I squinted my eyes shut. I don't know what thought was going through my mind, but right then, I reverted to an age-old tactic, pretending to be asleep, playing dead. I could still see through a crack in my eyelids, but now the room was blurry as well as dark. I lay as still as possible, trying to keep my breathing normal. For a few seconds, nothing happened. There were no more sounds. And then, just as I was beginning to think I might have imagined it after all, the door swung inwards. Grandad stood in the frame. I couldn't make out his face, but I recognized his towering bulk. He was standing completely still, filling the doorway top to bottom, breathing heavily in the silence. He's just checking on you, I told myself. He's come to check that you're okay, that's all. But even as the thought went through my head, I saw something that made me suck in a sharp breath and tense my entire body below the covers. The shape of Grandad's head was wrong. It was all wrong. Even in the blurry shadows, the wrongness was unmistakable. His silhouette bulged out in strange places, 
forking out around the lower half of his face in a way I couldn't understand. I opened my eyes another fraction of an inch, unable to help myself. And what I saw did nothing to quiet the fear swirling in my chest. Grandad was wearing a mask. A black mask. It covered the lower half of his face, allowing space at the top for his eyes to peer over at me. The mask covered his mouth and nose, with multiple straps on each side stretching around his cheeks to the back of his head. It looked like one of those pollution masks people sometimes wore in big cities. I snapped my eyes fully shut, forced myself to breathe in, then out, then in again. Nice and slow. I kept my ears strained for the sound of Grandad's feet on my bedroom floor, but it never came. After a while later, I heard the soft squeak of the door shutting and his footsteps receding down the hall. We never spoke about him coming into my room. I never mentioned it to Grandad, and he never said anything about it to me. I never told anyone else either. I thought about telling Mom or Dad after that first visit, but in the end, I kept quiet. Partly because I was so happy to be home again, I think, but mostly because the memory had taken on a strange quality by that point. It was like an old, half-forgotten nightmare. I could still picture it, but the fear I'd felt at the time had faded. It was as though the whole thing had happened to someone else. The feeling didn't last, though. Next month, Mom got ill again, and I was packed back off to Grandad's cottage. I protested harder that time, but Dad still wouldn't bend. He just told me to stop being selfish and to give my mom some space so she could get better. Wouldn't look at me as he said it. And once again, when I stayed at Grandad's cottage, he came to my room, stood in the shadows of the doorway, the same black mask on his face. He never touched me or anything. I don't want you to think that. This isn't that kind of story. He simply stood on the threshold of my room, on the edge of the moonlight, staring at me. Then, after a while, he'd leave again. The ritual happened every time he visited. It's been happening each month for the past three years, and it was only yesterday that I finally learned the truth. Only yesterday, when all the pieces clicked into place at last. Around my 16th birthday, I began to get ill, weak and tired, with no energy, hungry all the time. I got this prickly rash on my body too, and my muscles and bones constantly seemed to ache. It was summer, so there was no school, but I stayed in bed all day, falling in and out of a broken sleep, dreaming. The dreams were vivid and strange. In them, it was night time, and I was running, sprinting through the woods as fast as I could, faster than I'd ever gone before in my life. The moon hung overhead in a purple-black sky, framing me like a spotlight. And, at the end of each dream, I stumbled out into a clearing. I'd see Grandad's cottage, and just as his front door began to creak open, I'd wake up in a cold sweat. Yesterday evening, Dad visited me in my room, came and sat beside my bed. He told me that Mom was ill too, and that he'd have to take her away for a few days. Told me to get lots of rest. But when I asked him what time he'd be coming home, he told me he wouldn't. Not for a few days anyway. He said he'd be back when Mom was better, and in the meantime, Grandad was going to come around and look after me. That was when I finally lost it. I was too ill to get properly angry at him, but I did my best. 
screamed and yelled, told him I didn't want Grandad to come and stay with me. I wanted him and Mom, accused him of abandoning me, said I hated him. He just sat on the chair beside my bed and took it, listened to me without saying anything. The guy looked more tired and old in that moment than I'd ever seen him look before in my life. And when I was finally finished, when my throat was so raw I couldn't yell anymore, he said something to me. Something that started a conversation I'll never forget. I know you don't understand why I'm doing this right now, but you will, soon. Grandad will explain everything. I sighed and laid back against my pillow, exhausted. I don't want Grandad to explain anything, Dad. I want you here. I know you do, James, but I can't stay here. Not right now. It's not safe for me. I opened my eyes fully and stared at him, suddenly alarmed. What do you mean it's not safe? Am I contagious or something? No, no, he shook his head. It's not like that. It's just that I, at certain times of the month, I have to... He sighed again and looked down at me, shook his head once more. It really is best if your grandfather explains all this, James. Your mother can help too when she's back. I might know more about it than most, but I don't really know. Not like them. I had the urge, almost overwhelming, to reach out and shake him. I didn't understand anything he was saying. What do they need to explain? I said. Can you please just tell me what the hell is going on? My dad sighed again. He stood up and walked over to my bedroom window, then peered out through the curtains. Big moon up there tonight, he said after a moment. Not even dark out, and I can already see it. He stared through the glass for a while and turned back around, turned to face me. James, you know how your mum gets poorly each month, he said, how she has to go away for a while until she's better? I nodded. Of course I knew. Okay, well, the reason she has to go away is because she has this... this rare condition. It only flares up every once in a while, and it's easy enough to predict when it's going to happen. But that's the only thing about it you can predict. At her age, they can get... Well, your mother finds it hard to... To do certain things, I suppose. She finds it hard to act in a certain way. What condition does she have? Your granddad would explain that better than me. Why will he explain it? Why can't you just tell me? Because he has it too. I don't understand why you can't... I paused, suddenly processing what my dad had just said. Wait, did you say Grandad has it? Dad nodded. After a while, he sat down on the end of my bed, ran a hand through his hair. It's genetic, James. Grandad has it, and your mum has it, and you have it as well. I stared at him, unsure I'd heard him correctly. I... I have... Yes, you do. It's not a bad condition, exactly. But it's something that has to be managed carefully. Your granddad has lived with it for a long time, and he knows all about it. He'll be able to help you. Blood was pounding in my ears. Thoughts and memories were suddenly pressing at the edge of my mind like angry dogs. I pushed them away and focused on Dad. Is that why you started sending me to his house every month? So I got to know him better? So he could help me with whatever the hell this is I've got? Dad stared at me with sadness in his eyes. It 
wasn't my idea, he said after a moment. Your mother said it was best. Grandad agreed with her. When you're coming of age, it's good if you can spend time with older ones of there. Well, like I said, your granddad can explain it. I bit back another urge to scream at him. I still didn't really understand what the hell he was talking about. Or at least, the main part of my mind didn't understand. At the same time though, something was nagging at me. Images and memories circled around the outskirts of my brain, just out of sight. Monsters around the campfire. I swallowed. You said it wasn't safe for you, I said after a moment. When mom gets ill, you said you can't be around her. Dad paused, then nodded his head. And what about granddad? Are you safe around him? Dad opened his mouth, then closed it again. He frowned. Your grandfather is better at dealing with his symptoms, he said eventually. He's had longer to get used to them than your mother has. But no, I still wouldn't be safe. Not completely. So why was I safe? I exploded. Why did you ship me off to stay with him every month? Is that why I've caught this damn thing? No, no. I told you, it's genetic. You were born with it. And besides, your grandfather would never hurt you. We took extra precautions on the worst nights too. I insisted on it. We made sure you'd never... But my dad's voice was suddenly growing distant. The things circling my mind had grown close enough for me to see them at last. They came out of the shadows and were lit up by the flames. Exposed. A barrage of images and memories flew through my head in a blur. I remember the times Mom had come home with scratches of her arms. I remember the dreams I'd had where I was running through the woods. I remembered Grandad standing in my bedroom doorway in the cottage, a black mask covering his face. And in that moment, I realized something I'd never understood before. Something that filled me with a sickening combination of terror and excitement. The thing on Grandad's face hadn't been a mask after all. It was a muzzle. When I look back on what I saw there, in that small town, all I feel is numb. What else can you feel? in the face of such horror. The case I'm about to present before you is disturbing. It's not a pleasant story, and certainly not for those of weak hearts and stomach. But it's a story that needs to be told. It all began in the woods surrounding a small town about a month ago. It was in these woods the first victim was found a man by the name of Tom Grady. His body was found naked, his face skinned off. The police's main suspicions were on a crazy drug-fueled murder of some sort, or maybe a regular drug-fueled naked run through the woods that ended in a meeting with a bear. Extraordinary, but simple when you look at it. That was, until they checked his stomach contents. The coroner, a solid man by any standard, had to get out of the room to vomit into a trash can. They found his face in his stomach. The main theory shifted again. The man was drugged on some crazy stuff and did what he did on drugs. That one lasted as long as a month before the forensic report came back. The man was clean as a teddy bear. Just crazy then. It couldn't be anything else. Then, it happened again. Two bodies 
together in the woods. A man and a woman, naked, their faces skinned. At least this time, the coroner didn't vomit when he pulled out their half-digested faces from their digestive tracts. Nor were there any theories for the negative test results to dash. Only blind confusion. It happened again. A kid, 15, naked in the woods. And again, even younger, 13. And it kept on happening. Every couple of days, a new victim in the woods. A figure started forming when the local newspaper printed the first sighting of the skin man. An old photo, black and white, with just one small caution, taken in the woods. It was poorly lit, showing a figure among the trees, at first glance, naked. His head was blank. Then, as your eyes adjusted, you could see it clearer. From the neck down, his whole body's skin was face after face, stitched together to form a humanoid clothing. From this, a legend started to grow. The skin man was a demonic spirit that lived in the woods that lured people into the woods and made them mutilate themselves. The whole thing was horrific, nasty, and none of my business. I wouldn't have bothered with these urban legends and skinnings at all. At least, until I got a phone call from an old college friend, John. The skin man had taken his eight-year-old son. I was on the extremely shady side of the PI business. None of my friends ever wanted me to work for them, even if I offered. So I knew he was calling me out of sheer desperation. I arrived at the town the day after. His household had held up incredibly well after the death. His wife sought comfort from a support group on social media. Tom Grady had been an active member of the group, so the whole community was mourning together. John had a friend in the police force, the coroner who performed the autopsy. He was how I got the vomit story. Great guy. Together, I and the coroner made a promise to John. I would do anything and everything in my power to find out what was going on, legal or not. The coroner would try as much as he could to point his colleagues in the direction I'd give them. We saw an oath in his son's bedroom. It took me three months to scrounge everything I needed at the end of it. I called John and his police friend over. I was surprised to see the coroner arrive first, while John was the one who was late, by a whole hour. Sorry I'm late, I was with my wife, trying to find a phone. She lost it sometime. I waved it by. We'll talk later. I solved it. I motioned them to follow me. I led them to my living room, where I had set up my projector. I want you to know one thing. None of this is legally enforceable in a court. The only thing you'll get out of watching this is you'll know what exactly is happening in this town. I saw no rejection in their eyes, only grim acceptance. I turned on the projector. On the screen showed a young girl in a bedroom, lying on a bed. The lights were off and the only illumination came from a window peering outside. John twitched. That's my neighbor's daughter. Yes, I stole the tape from her parents. He had a disgusted look and moved as if to block the projector, but I pointed to the screen. Look at the window. The light from her window came from another window. It was from a lamp shining upon the bedroom. John stepped back as recognition clicked in his head. It was his son's bedroom. The very night he disappeared. He was right there, lying in his bed. Through the girl's window, he could see everything. 
For a few moments, we sat together in silence, watching the child as the moment of reckoning drew nearer. Then we heard a loud screeching noise. It was hard to make out what it was due to the heavy distortion. For a few seconds, nothing happened. Then the bedroom door lock turned and opened, revealing a silhouette of a humanoid figure standing in the hallway. It marched forwards towards his son's bed, hands reaching for him. It crossed the lamplight, and I heard a gasp from behind me as the face of John's wife emerged from the darkness. As we watched, she grabbed her son's shoulders and shook him awake. She whispered something into his ear and took him in her arms. As she carried him down the stairs, the screeching noise started again. Still distorted, but now clear enough to be identified as the sound of a car revving up. I paused the tape. John was frozen, just staring blankly at the screen. God. Frozen was just how I needed him. Otherwise, he might have punched me for what I did next. I took out a phone. John's wife's phone. I told you I was shady. As I punched in a password and accessed her group on social media, I pulled up her messages, connected to the projector, and cast it onto the screen. And then, the real story started. The story of a cancer that had been growing in this closed town. A cancer that hid under the skin of a support group. The chat showed the slow degradation of the group into a cult. No, not a cult. A cult takes passion. What these people had was intense apathy to human life. Originally, the purpose of the parent support group had been to be just that. A place for parents to vent and be comforted. Over the course of several months, the support had been becoming more and more derailed. More posts started showing up about how ungrateful their kids were, how much of their lives the parents had to give up to raise them, how they were forming gangs. They couldn't have raised such delinquents, could they? Slowly, a growing belief was starting to spread among the members that their children were cursed, born evil. It was here that the skin man was really born. It was Sean Theron who dug up the old tale. The skin man was an ominous figure from an old wives tale, a dark influencer who wanted discord and whispered dark things to children, corrupts them until their soul ran black and then led them to skin their parents alive. Maybe it was supposed to be a joke at first. Ooh, the skin man. He was the real reason the town's kids were so rotten. Ooh, the skin man. What other sensible reasons was there? None. It was the only reasonable explanation. People started talking about how they sometimes thought their children would spend too much time talking to themselves in their room. How they thought they might have heard someone talking back. How the children seemed awfully fond of the woods. And then, one day, it stopped being a joke anymore. A tale from the city came of a boy who killed his own father. The group was aflame. How could they stand by and watch this dark figure destroy their world? How could no one else do anything when the evidence was so strong? When it was all so obvious? The skin man was doing it. They had to do something, and it had to be outside the system. Because the skin man might have gotten to everyone else. Tom Grady, an ardent supporter of the original purpose of the group, was going to shut the whole thing down. He offered a desperate plea to the mob, asking them to come to their senses. 
That didn't go down well with them. After all, if you couldn't see that the skin man had to be stopped, you were either getting in the way, or worse, actively supporting him. Once again, it was Sean Theron who started it. He privately messaged to everyone in the group, begging them to take action against this dark figure that was ruining their lives. Tom was practically a follower of the skin man by opposing the group. It was kill or be killed. So, they grabbed him. He was their first victim. Their experiment to finalise their method. But the stomach? Once you dismiss the impossible, only the possible, no matter how horrific it may be, remains. Tom was force-fed his own skin. The group was ecstatic. Celebration all round. True justice. Justice the system wouldn't understand. Victory against the skin man. John's wife sent more than a few flirty messages to the hero, Sean. From there, the horrific crusade continued. Parents were given the duty of purifying their children. And so they did. Their children weren't really their children. Demons sent by that cursed figure. Demons that had eaten their real children and would soon come to torture them. It was self-defense against the greater evil. Vengeance against the skin man. And that was that. John had dropped to the floor now, kneeling, his eyes still staring away at nothing. We helped him to his feet and accompanied him to his home, where we left him, sitting in silence in his living room. From that day on, the very structure of the investigation changed. Instead of searching for a single killer, the focus turned on the parents. And the results came rushing. Dozens arrested in the first week. John's wife was one of the first. It should have been the biggest story of our time. But it isn't. The story hasn't spread at all. Sean Thierron was the editor of the newspaper. There was absolutely nothing found against him. Not even on the Grady case. I don't know how a guy like that was so clean. But he's still free now. Free to run his pen all over the morning news. All the people of this lonely little town knows now that the skeptics and the pig-headed police were now arresting ordinary people for the crimes of the dreaded skin man. His daughter hasn't disappeared. Yet... Despite my very presence there putting me at risk, I managed to get a message through to his wife. Recently, the newspapers have turned against her, openly calling her a whore and a liar. I hope to God she gets custody. A heavy fear hangs on me that I won't be able to enter the town again. John's been at the police station, protesting day and night of his wife's innocence. He's talking about possession and shape-shifting. He still believes in the skin man. Recently, not one hour ago, I got a text from my police friend. It was about John's wife. She's now saying the skin man made her do it. My wife and I have a tradition. Every anniversary, after we go to whatever theatre or fancy restaurant we can scrape enough dough for, we give each other a present. She gets me a new tie, and I get her a cartoon. Growing up, my wife loved animated television shows. It was her hobby. When she wasn't doing schoolwork, chores or playing with her friends, she was watching cartoons. She continued this habit from diapers to art school, 
and had built up quite the collection, sprawling across a collection of DVDs, VHS tapes, laser discs, and even some film reels. That's actually how I got to know her. I'd like to talk to her about what animated shows are my favourites while she painted. So, every year, I try and find some cartoons she's never heard of. I don't always succeed, but I was riding high after last year's victory. I had managed to scrape up an ancient Ukrainian VHS in a book nook. It only cost me three bucks, and thankfully it didn't crumble to dust by the time I got home with it. This year, I was determined to beat her again but work had been pretty busy lately. I'm a substitute elementary school teacher, and the flu had knocked a good number of teachers out of commission, so I was pretty much busy all day. As luck would have it, I found my salvation in my colleague, Milos. Milos was referred to exclusively as Mr. C by all the students, since his Eastern European last name rolled off the tongue like a sea urchin. A grey-haired man in his early sixties, he spoke with a heavy accent and was notorious for never remembering anybody's name. But all the kids liked him, thanks to his polite, harmless nature, and the faculty was quite fond of him too. One afternoon, during lunch, I was in the teacher's lounge drinking a soda, and in came Milos. I waved, and he gave me a smile in return. He bought himself some peanut butter crackers from the vending machine and sat down across from me. We talked for a little while about whatever stupid decision the school board had made and the conversation eventually changed to that of our wives. He had been married for 30 years, so he had much more to say than the five I'd been together with my spouse. I told him about our anniversary tradition and he sat up a little straighter. It's funny you should mention that. I was going through my attic last week, and I found a box of my mother's video cassettes. Really? That's interesting. What was inside? I asked. Most of them were old recordings of me as a young man, but one of them was a cartoon I'd never seen before. My wife would probably know what it is. What's it called? I'm not sure, Milo said, pausing to think. But... I'd never seen anything like it. Quite strange. I only watched one episode before I lost interest. I asked him if I could borrow it to see if my wife had somehow overlooked whatever cartoon this was. Ah, you can have it, Milo said with a wave of his hand. I'm too old for such things. You mean it? Yes, the condition is poor, but it still runs in the VCR. We made an agreement, and Milo showed up the next day with a tape. I offered to buy him lunch in exchange, but he politely refused, saying, Getting rid of some of the clutter is payment enough. I examined the tape, tucked into a blank sleeve with some text drawn on it in Sharpie. It was written in Cyrillic characters, so I had no idea what it said but there looked to be 11 episodes of this strange cartoon recorded onto it. So, I completed my day and came home at around 5. My wife wouldn't be home until 8, since she was attending an auction, so after I finished my paperwork and ate some supper, I decided to see if the tape contained anything that my wife's watchful eye may have accidentally overlooked. I went to the living room with a glass of white wine and our cat, Frisbee, and popped the old VHS into the tape player, sitting on the love seat with Frisbee purring in my lap. I had laid my laptop next to me so I could decipher some of the text if need be. It took a couple of seconds, but I soon saw the tracking signal show up on screen. The only semblance of credits was a few words that briefly flashed on the black screen. They were written in plain white text, and I paused the tape to type the words into Google Translate. As you all know, Translate isn't a flawless program to say the least, but it claimed that the words were Bulgarian and translated to something like, this is the first episode. 
the episode started in what looked like a college dorm room. There were two beds, and the only occupied one had someone sleeping under the covers. This person woke up and tossed his covers off. He looked like an average college kid, with scruffy facial hair and a university t-shirt on. He ambled away into the bathroom, which was off screen, and, after a few sounds of rustling clothes on running water, walked back on screen in a jacket and toque. One thing I noticed off the bat was the meticulous detail put into the art and animation. The backgrounds had all kinds of extra things to look at, a model airplane halfway built sitting on a desk, open drawers with clothes hanging out of them, the light of the window fading and reappearing in accordance to unseen clouds. Every frame of the character's walk cycle was unique, no reused shots or loops. Every step he took was slightly different than his last one. If this was a weekly cartoon, the animators must have been working pretty damn hard to deliver this level of quality. Anyway, this character left his room and walked down an empty hallway, his sneakers making hollow thumping noises against the ground. Once again, sounding like each sound effect was unique. It reminded me of Courage the Cowardly Dog. The creators claimed that they wanted to make a cartoon based largely around sound. For all I knew, this could have been their inspiration. The protagonist left the building, the outdoors a dreary looking representation of an urban landscape with a layer of what was either mist or smog hanging over the tops of the windowless buildings. There was no soundtrack, just the sound of his feet on the pavement and urban ambience in the background. The distant roar of traffic on a freeway, the occasional shrill backing up signal, once I heard the squeak of brakes, though oddly enough, I didn't see a single vehicle. I could see the individual wisps of breath rise from the protagonist's mouth, implying it must have been cold out. So far, so good. I didn't recognize anything, and I doubt my wife had seen anything like this. The whole thing had a level of pretentiousness that she fell for hook, line, and sinker. Minutes came and went as I watched this poker-faced young man walk to whatever destination he was heading to. It didn't take long for me to lose interest. Good animation or not, boring is still boring, and watching this kid trudge down an empty street wasn't all that riveting in my opinion. The only event worth mentioning during this endless walk was when the kid walked past somebody else. The angle of the shot was positioned so it faced the stranger's back, and they were dressed in heavy clothes too, and the two passed each other with a quick greeting without even looking at each other. He stopped all of a sudden, in front of a largish building, and he looked up at it. Even though it lacked any defining features, the boy seemed to recognize it and went through the door. When he entered, there was a small group of girls, all holding thermoses, talking quietly in the corner of the lobby of whatever building this was, and they all went silent when the protagonist drew close to them. He stopped and he stared at them. The girls all looked like they were trying to hold back laughter, and the guy had the same bland expression he had the entire episode. They stared for a good five seconds, before one of the girls promptly threw the contents of her cup into the guy's face. He winced and stumbled back with a hand over his eyes. Apparently, they found their random act of cruelty hilarious, because they started cackling like harpies. The scene switched back to the guy, who was now covering his whole face, liquid running down his hands and dribbling all over the floor. As he tried to right himself, he slipped and fell, landing back first onto the floor. The girls' laughter was rekindled, and now they were pointing and drawing as much attention as possible, despite the fact that no one else was around. I was shocked when I saw the skin on his face was blistering. That beverage in the thermos must have been hot. 
After the poor kid got back to his feet, he pushed past them and travelled deeper into the building. The girls threw what was left of their beverages at him as he fled. The episode ended with a close-up of the main character's blistered, distraught face. At this point, I had to fast forward because the speakers had suddenly released a deafeningly loud shriek. Frisbee fled out of shock, and I seriously think that if my volume had been turned up any higher, my wine glass might have shattered. Thankfully, that seemed to be the end of the episode, so I didn't have long to wait before I could go back to normal speed. I turned my volume down to almost silent and warily pressed the play button. The electronic wailing had vanished, and apparently another episode was beginning. The title card read, and this is the second one. It was identical to the way the first episode began, beginning with the protagonist, his face unblemished, climbing out of his dormitory bed. My initial thought was that there was a recording mistake, but this theory was quickly debunked when I realised that the protagonist was in a different set of pyjamas. This time, instead of going to the bathroom, the kid went to the desk next to his bed and sat down. In one motion, he swept all of the clutter off the surface, papers and food wrappers fell to the ground beside him, and the model plane smashed into dozens of little pieces. He opened the top of the drawer and removed a sewing kit, placing it onto the desk. It cut to a view of his face, staring down at the palm-sized kit on the desk. He withdrew another object from Hammer Space. For those unaware, Hammer Space is the area where all cartoon characters pull their supplies from, that is to say, nowhere. It was a doll, a crude, stereotypical caricature of a baby. Its eyes were gazing off into the distance, and the mouth was puckered into a dopey little O, with blushing red cheeks and hair the colour of sand. The protagonist stared down at this doll with the same poker face he had kept up since the first episode. He then picked up the needle from the sewing kit, threaded it, and began to work on the doll. The shot was angled in a way that you couldn't see the doll's face while he sewed it. The screen showed the protagonist's face as he worked for a good minute. Then he appeared to have finished, and it showed the end result. The doll's face was snarled in black thread. Its eyes were now X'd out, and a sinister grin was formed with tiny, vertical lines serving as the mouth, and two longer diagonal ones shaped in a way to resemble eyebrows. The cute, innocent-looking little thing now looked like some kind of wicked voodoo artifact. The protagonist stared down at his masterpiece and actually cracked a tiny smile. As macabre as his creation was, he seemed genuinely proud of it. The episode ended after that. I've seen some bizarre animation in my life, from coonskin to heavy metal to the triplets of Belleville, but this... This was the type of thing you'd find in David Lynch's garbage disposal. The kind of artsy, disturbing crap that some uber-Christian mom probably thought contained a demonic message telling kids to eat babies. But hell, it was unique. And it was free, so I decided to use it. I was about to stop the VCR, but then the next title card popped up. Instead of just a few words... This one looked like a whole essay, the entire screen taken up by words. Credits, maybe? Just to satiate my curiosity, I typed a few words into translate to see what it said. Ears-san, hello, this is my... It was a message. Now intrigued, now intrigued, I typed the rest of the text and, accounting for Google's Translate's many mistakes, I think the message roughly translates to something like this. Yes, son. Hello. This is my animation for Academy. I... 
laboured, maybe worked on it for a long time, and I have, for you, I hope or wish, you enjoy, and I will do it soon. Further research taught me that Eerson is a Bulgarian male name, and coincidentally, there's an artist named Eerson Giosalev, who's done a lot of illustrations for children's books, who's also, you guessed it, Bulgarian. Whether or not this is the same Eerson this message was addressed to is beyond me, but there you go. The third episode had the exact same beginning as the first two, and I was sensing a pattern forming here. The same kid got out of bed, wandered into the bathroom, freshened himself up, and came back fully dressed. Looking carefully, I found the stitched face doll from the previous episode on his desk, the needle jabbed vertically into its forehead. It was eerily familiar to the first episode, but with an entirely new set of animations to show the exact same events unfolding. I wasn't looking forward to watching the kid make his pilgrimage to that building again, so I took the opportunity to use the bathroom while the tape ran. Unfortunately, while I was out of the room, that ear-shattering squeal rang out again, and I had to hurry back to shut it off once more. I kept the audio muted for my sanity's sake as I watched the next scene unfold. The girls, who had mercilessly harassed the protagonist earlier, were nowhere to be found, and he continued into the next room without incident. It was a large room, presumably an auditorium, with a bunch of folding chairs set up in front of a raised platform. On this platform stood a new character, a man about my age, with coke bottle glasses and a dorky pink tie. If I had to hazard a guess, I'd say he was supposed to be a professor, since the protagonist was clearly in college. After a few more people filtered into the room and sat in the audience, the professor, as I'll call him, began talking. I tried turning the sound on to hear what he was talking about, but the audio was overlaid with screeching, so I had no choice but to mute it. I did my best to try read his lips, but I think the dialogue must have been in Bulgarian too. About a minute into his lecture, the professor took his glasses off and rubbed his eyes before putting them back on and continuing. He was either really engaged with whatever he was talking about, or really angry about it, because he was going off the rails. I could see his face flushing and beads of sweat emerging on his brow. The audience of about six people didn't seem to care in the slightest. Mid-rant, the professor's eyes bugged out of his head, and he grabbed his neck, as though he was choking. His glasses fell off, and his tongue stuck out rigidly as he stumbled around, grasping at his throat. It was animated with hideous detail. I could see every individual vein swelling up on his neck, and someone even took the time to animate the ribbons of drool running down his chin. Despite his obvious distress, not one of the audience members budged an inch, staring at him with bored indifference. Eventually, the professor collapsed onto his back and lay spread-eagled on the platform, two streams of blood trickling from his eyes as though he had just been strangled. The audience sat there for a moment before calmly getting up and exiting, not looking or speaking to one another. The episode ended with an overhead view of the auditorium. The professor left abandoned on the stage. From this point on, I'm not going to describe every single episode with such detail for brevity's sake. I'll just summarise the basic plot and show what the title card at the beginning said. Episode 4 Text It should be clear what this is. The protagonist goes to his desk again and starts writing on a piece of paper, scratching at the back of his neck constantly. Near the end of the episode, 
the protagonist examines his fingers, which are now bloody. A shot of his neck reveals a giant welt, which he seemed to have scratched to the point of bleeding. Episode 5 Text I wish it could have been this easy. The protagonist picks up the piece of paper he was writing on, which still has bloody fingerprints on it, and tucks it into an envelope, exiting his room with it. He goes to a new building, which resembles another dorm, and slides the letter under the door of another room marked 056. He leaves, and a close-up on his neck reveals a bandage, which he promptly tears off. The wound from the last episode is absent. Episode 6 Text It was so... and a word I can't translate. The protagonist goes to another new building, a dining hall. He meets the stranger from the first episode, whose face is still hidden, and the two sit down together and talk. The rest of the episode is only one shot, an over-the-shoulder view of the protagonist from behind his friend. As the two of them talk, one can see a member of the kitchen staff overzealously tenderizing a chunk of meat in the background, bits of gristle flying all over the place. The episode ends after the stranger gets up and exits, leaving the protagonist to sit by himself and stare into space. Episode 7 Text I tried not to... blank What I... was, or maybe felt The protagonist goes to his desk again and starts scratching down the beginnings of another note The camera cuts away at about the two minute mark to the door where an envelope is slid under it into the room The protagonist goes to pick it up and suddenly becomes very excited when he sees the sender. He returns to his desk with an eager look in his eyes and sits down to open it. The camera faces his back as he reads it, sitting silently. He starts to tremble. He balls his fist, crumples the note into a wad and hurling it against the wall. He storms into the bathroom and the rest of the episode is spent staring at an empty room and hearing the kid shouting and crying off screen. Episode 8 Text That isn't important. This is the shortest episode, narrowly escaping the four minute mark. The protagonist is absent, his bed empty. Instead, the opposite bed is shown to have someone in it. Someone who's neither visible nor asleep. The figure twitches and thrashes around under the covers, but is unable to get up. The reason is clear. The blanket is anchored to the bed with barbed wire, each length tied to an opposite side of the bed frame, so the person, at least I assume it's a person, was tied to the bed like luggage to the top of a car. The figure squirms for a good while before going limp. Episode 9 There was no title card for this episode. This episode has its typical beginning. The protagonist getting up and putting his clothes on. The opposite bed is unoccupied again, with no signs of a previous struggle. The protagonist stops halfway to the door and turns around. He looks directly into the camera, smiling, and starts talking. I had pumped the volume down to barely audible to avoid any more yelping from the speakers, so I tentatively turned it up a few notches. I was immediately punished for my curiosity when that ghastly wail presented itself again, drowning out any semblance of dialogue, and I silenced it in disgust. The protagonist speaks to the viewer for a few minutes, laughing every once in a while, and then exits, ending the episode. Episode 10 This episode was shown from the top-down perspective and appears to pick up exactly where episode 9 left off. 
the camera follows the protagonist on his walk to the same building he'd travelled to in episodes 1 and 3, zooming out to an almost outrageous degree when the camera enters the outdoors. It got to a point where the protagonist was merely an ant-sized figure scuttling down a turgid collection of identical coloured rectangles. It was at this point where the video appeared to have been damaged, the image being shredded by stripes of black and white static and jerking violently. I heard the VCR give a panicked whir as it tried to make sense of the corrupted film, and eventually, the TV screen was engulfed in snow. I should have been pleased that I wouldn't have to watch anymore, but there was an inkling of curiosity that I couldn't get rid of. True, the show's narrative had been wafer thin at best, but I kind of wanted to see the 11th episode, just to see if it brought the plot it pretended to have to a close. I got my wish. As I was searching for the remote, the static on the screen flickered. I paid no mind at first, until it flickered again, this time more violently. The wall of hissing nonsense that covered the screen was flinching, like something on the other side was trying to force its way out. And all at once, the picture snapped back into existence. It was another title card. Thankfully, I'd found the remote, and I got the chance to pause it and type the text into Google Translate. It read, This is my favourite episode. I remember letting out a noise of confusion when I unpaused the tape. It showed an empty room, with four chairs arranged in an untidy row, a small table sitting beside them. The animation was completely different from the previous episodes. Unlike the pseudo-Disney, hand-drawn nature of the previous ten, episode 11 looked more like it had been rotoscoped. Rotoscoping is an animation technique where artists trace over live-action footage frame by frame. It's a very old practice. If you've ever seen the music video of a take on me, you can get the idea of what the scene looked like. Except, much less professional. The image remained static for a few moments, until someone appeared in the chair, second from the left, after a jump cut. It was a girl, unconscious from the way she was sunned over. Soon after, another girl blipped under the frame, seated on the farthest right, similarly limp. Eventually, all four chairs were occupied by an unconscious girl. Even though I probably shouldn't have, I unmuted the television. There was no shrieking anymore, or any noise at all for that matter. I jumped when the silence was broken by a loud creak, followed by some footsteps. There was a noticeable dip in audio quality, the sound being muffled and dull. When the footsteps stopped, there was a short thud and a shrill noise that sounded like someone undoing a zipper. The angle was obstructed when a body moved in front of the camera. With the boiling lines of the rotoscoped figure twitching like mad, it took a second for me to realise that this person was showing a small, cylindrical object to the audience. The person set it down on the small table and removed a tiny pill from their pocket, promptly swallowing it. They turned to one of the girls, who was still unconscious, and gently shook her. When there was no response, they sighed and walked off screen, returning a few seconds later with a bucket. They threw the contents of the bucket directly onto her face, the girl waking with a frightened squeal. After she blinked and spluttered for a few moments, she looked up at the offender. A look of absolute horror spread across her face. The person spoke, disclosing his identity as a male. Then, I felt my stomach tighten. I knew that voice. It was the protagonist. I haven't the slightest idea of what he said, 
but the girl furiously shook her head to deny whatever he accused her of. He then lunged at her and seized a handful of her hair, the girl beginning to scream and sob hysterically. The protagonist snatched the cylinder off the table and shoved it into the audience a second time before a knife sprung from the other end. It was a switchblade. He then drove it into the girl's neck. She was unable to scream now. The blade must have hit a larynx. A feeble gurgling noise was the only thing that she had left. The protagonist removed the knife, blood spurting from the wound. This was the only thing that had any colour through the entire segment, being a muddy red. The girl beside her had woken up and was set to screaming when she saw her neighbour gagging on her own blood. The protagonist clapped a hand over her mouth, slitting her throat with one quick slash. I couldn't take it anymore. This had officially crossed the line. I lunged for the remote, but I moved too quickly and knocked it off its place on the armrest and it tumbled out of reach. Cursing myself, I got down on all fours and grasped for it, trying to ignore the agonized screams and pleading coming from the television. By the time I found it, it was too late. The deed had been done. The bodies lying in monochrome silence. I was seconds from pushing the damn eject button, seconds from contacting Milos and demanding what kind of sick joke he had played on me. But I didn't. Something stopped me. The protagonist, the murderer, had taken something out of his jacket and now aimed it in the direction of the corpses. A cell phone. It wasn't even an old-fashioned model. It looked identical to an iPhone. The animator even shaded the Apple logo to make it more pronounced. That wasn't possible. This was an old cartoon. There was no way in hell there could have been an iPhone in it. And besides, if this really was a recent cartoon, why was it on a crappy VHS? And how did it end up in the possession of an Eastern European substitute teacher? Did Milos make it? Was this his idea of a practical joke? The last few minutes of the tape consisted of the protagonist taking pictures of his victims, but every time he snapped a photo, there would be a cut to a different image. It was the same scene, but it was live action, with grisly, full colour images of the girls and their wounds. The tape ended with a final message, which I had no time to translate. I was busy rifling through one of the kitchen drawers of the school directory. I finally found it and tracked down Miles' number. I would never contacted him before, but I needed answers. Now. Greg? I froze. I heard the familiar sound of the door closing and my wife entering the kitchen carrying a large canvas-like package. You'll never believe what they had there. Thank God we're so poor or I would... Her smile evaporated when she saw my expression. You're... pale... Do you feel all right? She inquired. I need to make a phone call, I managed to say. I grabbed the phone off the receiver and dialed in the number while my concerned wife went to put her things away. I paced the kitchen as I listened to the taunting buzz of the connection noise in my ear. Finally, Milos picked up the phone. Hello? I was ready to let him have it, but I didn't want my wife to hear anything. Milos, it's Greg Sykes. I need to talk to you about the tape you gave me. Oh, hello Greg. I'm sorry to hear that you're having trouble. Is it broken? The naivety in his voice made me want to throw the phone across the room. No, it's what's on the tapes. 
This isn't funny. In fact, it's pretty damn sick. Did you honestly think that giving me some fake snuff movie for my wife would be cute? There was a pause. I don't understand. Episode 11, Milos. Those dead girls. What are you talking about? Stop playing innocent. I kept my voice low, but I made sure to fill each word with venom. Where did you get those pictures, hmm? Some gorsite? Calm down. I don't know what you mean by dead girls. Milos, I've already told you that this isn't funny. Just apologize and we can put this past us. There was another moment of silence before Milo spoke again. Greg, listen to me. I don't know what you saw, but I can assure you I didn't have anything to do with it. Do you need me to contact the police? You've scared me enough, goddammit. Isn't it enough that... A shrill scream from upstairs cut me off. My brain didn't bother to register anything until I reached my wife. I was downstairs, and then I was upstairs like I had teleported. It was afterward when I became aware that I had rammed my right big toe onto the bottom step while sprinting, trailing blood up to my bedroom. My wife was pressed against the bedroom wall opposite the window, her package jettisoned into the centre of the room. I had no need to ask her what was wrong. She was already pointing. The window now had something scrawled into the glass. Three symbols in a vertical column. X, I, I. Roman numerals of twelve. And below this, nailed to the sill, was a crude baby doll. Its eyes X'd out, given a malevolent smile with black string. The police were already on their way. Milos had contacted them after I dropped the telephone. I was going to search the house, but I realised that the message in the window was carved from the outside. I settled on locking every feasible entrance to the house, not bothering to question how someone could have reached our bedroom window on the second floor without a ladder. After everything was done, my wife and I sat in the bedroom she must have been crying. I remember her shaking in my arms. I know I should have been trying to comfort her, but I spent every moment of that agonizing wait for the police staring at the window. I practically flew to the door when I heard the urgent knocking, pulling my wife with me. I wasn't going to let her out of my sight again. I hesitated out of pure paranoia, leaving my wife to open it for me. Greg and Lisa Sykes? A middle-aged cop stood on our doorstep. Lisa invited him in, and the officer promptly yelled, Jesus Christ! The VCR was ablaze, melted to a rectangular block of slag. It must have been lit on fire earlier, and we just didn't notice up in our bedroom. The tape was still in there. It was going to be ruined. That was what had started all of this. That was what the police had to see. I grasped for the VHS slot and tried to ignore the pain from the burning metal. It took both my wife and the cop to pry me off, despite my protest that we needed to get the tape out of there. I eventually calmed down enough to explain what was going on to both of them. They both listened carefully, despite the insanity of the story. I told them everything, where I got the VHS, the weird title cards, the flawless animation, episode 11. The cops got a hold of Milos, but could ultimately find nothing incriminating. He couldn't answer any of the questions either, insisting that he had never seen the tape before he found it in the attic. We haven't spoken since. The case was eventually dismissed as harassment. I had no point to prove since the evidence had been destroyed. Try as I did, I couldn't get the VCR to open to retrieve the corpse of the tape. 
my wife has been acting more uncomfortable, even after I stopped mentioning the tape and we got a new window. That final message after episode 11 somehow remained stuck on the screen, even after the tape should have been ruined. When I couldn't sleep that night, I translated it. Episode 12 Coming soon. The night was still young as I cruised the outskirts of Golden Gate Park. I waited patiently for a ping from the Uber app. I needed the extra cash as I was in danger of being short on my rent. The phone chimed as I looked to see someone on the outer sunset needing a ride. The picture was a blonde woman with a big smile, and I accepted. It said she had two passengers, and the pay was decent. I found a spot to make a U-turn, and made my way to a small parking lot. I thought nothing of it at first. It seemed like a young couple who were about to have a night in the bay. It was curious though. I could see the woman dragging a man with black hair towards the car. She dragged him by a thick, leather leash attached to an even thicker collar. I had witnessed lots of things in the city, but even this was new to me. The car door opened and I asked, Lisa? Yes, that's me, she replied as she sat in the back seat. I looked at the man who stood outside. He looked hesitant to get in the car. She tugged on her leash with impatience. Get in here, Henry. Is he okay? He's fine. My husband just seems a little out of it tonight, she replied. The man sat in the car slowly and seemed to be staring into space. I know it can be wise to wear layers when in the city, but the man was wearing a rather large hoodie that was much too thick for an August night, even for here. So, we're going to Tenderloin, right? Yes, if we can get there as quickly as possible, that would be great. I was having trouble with my car, and we can't be late. Alright, well, let's get moving, I said while I looked in the rearview mirror to make sure the two were buckled in. I noticed the man's collar was very tight around his neck. I could see the red marks on his skin. The dark brown leather was strange, as it had symbols embossed on it. I'd never seen anything like it. I didn't think much of it though. I was more concerned by how tight it was, and how it looked like there may have been a struggle to put it on him. The woman noticed I was looking at it too. She frowned and asked, So, are you going to drive or not? We hit the road and headed towards the destination. We drove in silence as I tried my best not to look back at the two. I did notice that the man called Henry started to look puzzled as he stared out the window. Is everything okay back there? I inquired. Everything is fine, Lisa remarked. Where are you taking me? Henry asked with a strange tone to his voice. It was monotone and sounded like he was half asleep. The woman scowled at him and tapped him on the chest, signaling for him to be quiet. It was clear who was the dominant personality in the relationship, but I still found it quite odd. You know where we're going, Henry. I told you several times. You told me you were taking me to the temple. No, I told you we were going to a party, Henry. Lisa replied as she looked frustrated. I looked back in the mirror to see the man had a look of worry in his eyes. I felt like something was wrong with this woman. It seemed like the man was out of it. I started to think that he was on drugs. What kind of party? I asked as I looked at the woman who frowned. 
She didn't like me asking questions. I could see it in her eyes. She was trying to think of what to say. Like, is it a costume party? Does it matter? I'm just trying to make conversation, sorry. I want to know what kind of party it is, Henry mumbled as he turned to look at me. The woman grabbed his leash and then tugged on it hard. I could hear as he struggled for air and coughed. It was aggressive and showed a flash of anger. The sight of it made me uncomfortable. It's a sex party, she answered while she loosened the grip on the leash. Henry coughed then smiled a little bit. I curled my eyebrows as I looked at the two in the back. That's why he's wearing a collar, because he likes it. Whatever floats your boat, I'm not one to judge. An awkward silence fell in the car. I continued to drive to the location as Henry continued to keep his eyes locked on me in the mirror. He tugged on his collar and said, She is lying to you because she is planning on killing me. Lisa tugged on the leash and growled, Shut up, Henry. Stop joking around. This isn't funny, and you are going to freak the poor man out. Are you in danger, dude? I am, because this woman is not my wife. Don't listen to him. He likes to make people uncomfortable for his entertainment, Lisa said. Then why don't you show him what's in your pocket? Listen, I don't want any trouble. I don't want to see what she has. She has a weapon in her pocket. She has a weapon in her pocket, Henry said, as he lifted his hooded shirt to show a cut across his stomach that had been recently stitched and burned shut. It explained why he was so out of it. The man had to be miserable with pain. She used it on me earlier and put this collar on me. Shut up, Lisa yelled. Oh Christ, dude, do you need to go to the ER? I just want you to get me away from this woman and take this collar off, Henry pleaded. I started to hit the brakes, but then I felt something cold along my neck. I looked down to see the blade against my throat. Keep driving, or I'll have to kill you, Lisa growled, as I could feel it pressing against my skin. I lifted my foot off the brake and began to accelerate again. I could feel my hands tremble on the wheel. All right, all right, just don't hurt me. Then just keep driving, and you might live to see another day. I have a thought, Henry grumbled. Shut the hell up, Lisa yelled back. Yeah, let's just do what she says. How about you hit the brakes hard, Henry replied as he looked out the window. I don't see much traffic, so just trust me. Don't listen to him. If you want to live... I would do it now, Henry responded. I watched as he lunged at the woman and startled me enough that I slammed on the brakes. Then I fell into my lap and I caught a glimpse of the weird jagged blade. It had the same symbols as the collar. The car screeched to a halt and I heard Henry shout, Take the collar off now! I am begging you, don't listen to him, Lisa pleaded, as I turned awkwardly to see he had her pinned down. I reached in the back and realized it was my chance. I took the collar off from Henry and heard a growl that sounded like a wild animal. He smiled as he plunged his hands inside her captor's chest. The blood sprayed, hitting the interior and the window. That's much better, Henry remarked. I sat in my back seat, taking a glance at the mirror. Henry smiled back at me, 
and exited the car. He walked around the window, tapping it lightly. I rolled it down in shock. Thank you. I thought for a moment. I was nearly done. Henry, do we need to call the police? I asked nervously. I don't go by that name anymore. You can call me the Legion. Uh, okay, I responded as I watched him reach into his back pocket. I started to become nervous again. I thought I would die that night. He could see the fear in his face, to which he smiled back at me. Are you going to kill me? No, I owe you. You saved my life, Henry answered, as he grabbed my hand and placed cash in it. I looked to see a few hundred dollars. That should pay for the cleanup, and a little more. What the hell are you? I am a demon that will end the world, but don't look so scared. At least I tipped. I don't really like birds that much. I worked at a pet store for a while, and I know a handful of people that own or have owned birds in the past. They're loud, smelly, and they prefer to kick and peck seeds anywhere that isn't their cage. They're a pet for specific types of people, myself not included. Don't get me wrong, I don't hate birds. I just had no desire to have one as a pet which is why I was concerned for my mental well-being when I somehow became the host house and parental figure for several species of bird in my backyard. I don't have a massive or interesting space outside. There's one tree, a small garden, a shed, and a small deck with some patio furniture, all surrounded by a high fence. It's enough to sit out and relax without worrying about prying neighbours, but not much else. Since I retired, I began storing some of my personal hobbies in the shed, along with a few gardening tools, so I could spend more time outside. The birds didn't all appear at once, but I made the mistake of being too nice to one too many of them, and suddenly, my yard became some sort of aviary. I put out a small bird feeder for the little brown ones I saw hopping around on my tree, they're the ones you see in droves, shuffling out from underneath your car or nesting in the giant letters of your favourite big store box. The robins were the next frequent visitors, plucking worms out of the garden and making the bird feeder swing as they came barreling in to swipe some of the seeds for themselves. The blue jays were a bit of a rare sight in the beginning, but the shock of their bright plumage began to appear more often along the fence as the days went on. I didn't have a bird bath or anything, just that one feeder. Apparently, that was enough for word to travel through the bird grapevine, and my house became the hottest spot for birds in the whole town. In the span of two weeks, I went from a few birds going in and out of the bird feeder at a time, to tens of birds hanging out my tree and on my fence taking turns pecking at my one lonely bird feeder all day long. I accepted my fate the first time that bird feeder ran out in a single day. I looked at the situation logically. These weren't my pets. They were wild animals. They wouldn't be living in my house, so I wouldn't have to deal with the smell trapped inside. They could take care of themselves if they were desperate free to roam and never return to my house if they chose to. They also polished off every seed that fell out of the bird feeder. I lived on the side of a busy road where the houses were spread a bit further apart to keep the speed limit from dropping below 60 kilometers per hour, so I wasn't really worried about the neighbors becoming too interested in my new hobby. If the poop got too bad, I could just hose down the backyard in a few quick sweeps while watering the garden. 
I didn't see any real downsides to it. So, I went out the next day, bought another bird feeder to hang up in the tree, arming bird feeder for the deck, and a bird bath for the garden. If I was committing to a bird sanctuary, I was going all out. I was living alone at the time, and I hardly enjoyed having so many colourful birds to look at in the backyard. I'd miss it if they stopped coming here. The crows came a few days later, and it was a strange spectacle. I suppose in the urban jungle, crows was something of royalty. The other birds would squawk and shuffle out of their way as they hopped from branch to branch, their obsidian bodies massive in comparison to many of the other birds. I think for a period of time, they scared away several of the others, but eventually, they found their own balance amongst each other, and everyone settled back in. I grew more accustomed to the presence of so many birds, and eventually, I started talking to them. Begrudgingly, mind you, like they were my misbehaving children, especially the crows. They were almost the school bully, or a sibling always looking for a fight. Wait your turn, go sit with the others on the tree, don't be a brat. Go sit on the fence, you're too big for that branch, you'll snap it and scare the little ones. Don't bother the hummingbirds, they haven't done anything to you. Now, just as I was getting more comfortable with the birds, they were getting increasingly more comfortable with me. At first, they would fly away and watch me from the tree as I filled the feeder, but eventually, they just fluttered to the end of the deck, some of them brave enough to creep up closer and chirp at me. Yeah, yeah, it has to get filled at some point, you can wait 30 seconds to keep eating, I muttered turning and raising an eyebrow and the handful of little brown birds that all looked up at me with wide eyes. I had to admit, it was pretty cute. A crow cawed loudly at me from the edge of the fence nearby, interrupting my moment. You can quiet down over there, let them go first, I scolded with narrow eyes. Here, I grumbled, grabbing a handful of seed from my bag and backing away from the feeder, the smaller birds instantly pouncing on the contraption. The crow regarded me carefully as I walked to a different section of the deck, crouching down to put a pile of seeds on the planks of wood. I could hear the beating of their wings as three crows immediately landed a few feet away from where I was kneeling. Hey, hold on a sec. I glared up at them. All three shockingly obeyed freezing in their approach. I looked at them individually, an amused smile creeping over my face. All right, have at it, I laughed, standing up, the seeds at my feet. They didn't even bother waiting for me to move away, hopping over and pecking at the pile once I'd given the go-ahead. The birds continued to surprise me in the following weeks, especially the crows. I knew that they were smart birds, but it threw me for a loop sometimes at how well they seemed to pick up exactly what I was saying. My nagging seemed to hold more weight now, and they watched me more closely. They eventually didn't come over to me unless there was food involved, but it was an interesting development, and honestly, a better system. They left the little ones alone most of the time now, and waited patiently for me to hand feed them instead. I knew this could potentially be a bad thing, getting too attached to the wildlife, the wildlife getting too attached to me. I knew. I just did it anyway. The crows were funny. I started feeding them bits of my own food as well, since I knew crows were scavengers. I would probably eat anything, not just seeds. One day, I hadn't even put my scraps down, and I felt a weight drop suddenly onto my head. 
The wing flaps gave away what it was, but it startled the laugh out of me. So impatient, I muttered, but my lips were spread in a smile. They grew more comfortable with me, and even went as far as to come investigate and hang out with me, even when I didn't have any food. That was a big step. I had five crows that frequented my yard, and they would all park themselves at various points around me as I read a book or browsed my phone or laptop. I often putted about in the shed too, but I kept them out of it. They didn't like being barred from the shed, but it was basically the same rule as the house. They'd always squawk at me as if I was taking too long. All of them perched on the roof, waiting for me to come out. The next step was touching, and it was mostly accidental at first. I shifted my position or stand up after an hour or two of sitting on the patio chair and startle them into moving. Eventually, I had to gently nudge some of them out of the way in order to get up, one of them deciding that my lap was a good place to settle if my laptop wasn't there, or my shoulder if it was. I didn't ramble on or tell them extensive stories, but they followed my command and came when I called. I didn't need to name them, but I knew the five of them apart. They were always watching me when I was in the yard, and all I had to do was look at whoever I was talking to, and they understood. One day, I was pleasantly surprised when one of them brought me a gift. It wasn't anything special, it was literally just a stick. But I laughed, and I took it with a, thanks for the present buddy and a little two-fingered pat on his feathered head. Not all of them took up the gift-giving, thank God. Having two of them battling it out was enough. They would each bring me something at the end of the day that they'd found around town. I had a bucket that I kept outside. I'd take their little rock or their piece of plastic, and I'd give them a little scratch and a thank you before I'd put it in. There were small enough items that I didn't fill up the bucket very fast. A piece of a plastic spoon, a doll shoe, a shiny candy wrapper, the list goes on. They picked up early on that I didn't really like the food, because I would take it in the house and put it in the small compost bin and not into the bucket like the others. Another day, I got a shiny ring and felt a bit guilty about it. There weren't any markings, and I didn't have the time or energy to do anything about it, but I couldn't have them stealing valuable things and bringing too much attention to me. I took it inside, and they got the same message with the food. No precious metals. They picked up on a lot of things. The smart birds. One day, I was sitting around with my feet up, laptop on my lap, a crow on my shoulder, two crows on the table beside me, and a crow on one of the armrests I wasn't using. The one on my shoulder had already given his gift for the day and was rather pleased with himself. Wonder where the other one is, hey? I asked out loud to none of them in particular, distracted by my laptop. Ten minutes later, I heard the beat of wings but didn't bother looking up as I finished typing my paragraph. I felt pressure on my other shoulder, and then something tumbled abruptly down in front of my shirt and landed on my lap. My hands froze on the keyboard as my eyes flickered to my newest gift. An eyeball stared up at me, blood trailing messily down the front of my shirt and onto my pants. It was partially deflated, a pus like goop mixing in with the blood where it had landed and oozed out. It must have been punctured by the crow's beak as he carried it. I stared at the eyeball blankly for another moment, trying to process what to do. A dead animal was one thing, but this was clearly a human eyeball. 
My heart hammered in my chest as the crow shifted its feet around on my shoulder, clearly waiting for his praise. I carefully lifted myself out of the chair, grabbing the gooey mess in one of my hands. The birds hopped off my shoulder, their heads twisting to watch what I would do with the organ that had been so gracefully plopped onto my lap. I glanced over to the shed, staring at the crack in the door. I must have left it unlocked accidentally this morning, and I hadn't shut it all the way. I thought carefully where I might have stashed what I was looking for before shuffling away inside the house. The crow let out a squawk, disappointed at my current trajectory. One second, buddy, I said with a grimace, as I tried to think where in the house I'd left it. I walked quickly in and down to the basement, trying not to let the slimy mess in my hand drip onto the floor. It only took me a few minutes to find it, and I let out a relieved breath. All of you, come here, I called carefully as I emerged back out onto the yard. The crows shifted uneasily, flapping their wings in confusion as I walked over to the shed. They hesitated, wary, but eventually flew over to the grass where I stood in front of it. I had the eye in one hand and a new, shiny bucket in the other. I set the bucket down and opened the shed doors wide so they could all take a good look inside. It was clear that the one who'd brought me the gift had snuck in and taken a peek anyway and brought me something he thought I'd like. Hundreds of eyes stared out from inside the shed, pristine and perfect in their jars, lining every shelf I'd built to hold them. The new bucket was identical to the one I kept beside my chair on the desk. I was lucky I had a spare. I knelt and put it inside the shed, letting the eyeball slide off my hand and thunk down into it. That one wasn't usable, but perhaps I would receive one in better condition in the future, if I played my cards right. These go in an extra special bucket, okay? Good job. I grinned, and the crow hopped excitedly up to me for some well-deserved head scratches. Some of the others cawed and peered around me inside the shed with their heads cocked in curiosity. I really do love my murder of crows. If you happen to find an undocumented door in a recently purchased home, chances are it leads to the rice property. If you happen to enter said door, which admittedly is an inadvisable course of action, you may find yourself in a closet that goes on for far too long. In the event this happens, do not back out of the closet. It is very rude to leave an event after having just arrived. You must now attend the event, or the hosts will become distressed. They will follow you back to your house and try to make up for hosting such a disappointing event. The outcome is undesirable. You must continue to walk the length of the closet before emerging into the master bedroom. You have now officially entered the rice property. Do not look back or show any form of remorse or confusion at having arrived at the rice property. Proceed swiftly but calmly to the reception area. The location of this area may vary, but it is usually towards the direction in which the egg salad can be smelled. Please note that while the master bedroom is the main entrance to the rice property, it is not a place you should linger in. You are not the master. You do not belong in the master bedroom. In the event a servant sees you in the master bedroom, 
smile widely and apologize. Tell the servant you took a wrong turn looking for the washroom. The servant will then direct you to the washroom. Thank the servant, walk backwards out of the master bedroom and continue to the reception area. Please do not actually go to the washroom as this is where the mold lives. In the event the master is present in the master bedroom upon your arrival, get down on your hands and knees, close your eyes and count backwards from 500. There is an elevator and stairwell at the end of the corridor. The elevator travels at approximately 7,400 miles per hour, so it is best to take the stairs. Continue down the stairs until you arrive at the floor that smells the strongest of egg salad. It is important you arrive at the correct floor. If you believe you have arrived at the correct floor, go down one more floor to check if the smell is weakened. If so, return up to the correct floor. Please refrain from walking up more than one flight of stairs at a time. If this happens, the stairs may accidentally become infinite. If you choose the incorrect floor, you will be able to tell by the presence of a single door at the end of the corridor, behind which can be heard the sobs of a soft-voiced elderly male. There is a small chance a viscous black liquid will be leaking from the bottom of the door. Avoiding contact with it is in your best interest. Return to the staircase and find the correct floor. After arriving at the correct floor, Proceed to the reception area. The smell of egg salad should stop at this point. There will be a number of other guests present in the area. It is very important you do not make eye contact with them. Some guests may attempt to initiate small talk with you. You may notice they appear to be speaking English, but it is in a dialect too sophisticated for you to understand. If this happens, smile widely but continue to avoid eye contact. Then utter one to three sentences about any of the following subjects. Precious stones, fine wine, dirigibles, luxury cars, but only models released prior to 1950. After hearing you speak, the other guests will consider you to be an exotic foreigner and respectfully keep their distance from you. One or two guests may try to take small samples of your hair. This is normal. Let them. You may have noticed the music being played at this event is excruciatingly loud. Do not show any visible discomfort. A servant will likely be circulating the crowd with a platter of hors d'oeuvres. Make sure you obtain one as this will be your only chance to do so. Hold on to your hors d'oeuvre, but make sure not to eat it. This should already be a no-brainer, due to the food looking like television static. At some point, the master will appear at the top of the balcony overlooking the grand foyer. The guests will be distracted. This is your chance to leave through the main double doors behind you. If the master notices you leaving, he will ask very loudly where you are going, drawing the attention of all guests towards you. Should this happen, remove your hors d'oeuvre from its china plate and smash the plate as hard as you can against the marble floor. This will distract the guests long enough for you to leave unnoticed, but it should only be used as a last resort. After exiting the mansion, you will now find yourself on the grounds. You will notice that even though you are outdoors, the sky is not visible. Since you are surrounded by the towers of the mansion, which stretch into the clouds towards the vanishing point, do not look up at the mansion, as your sense of gravity might become inverted. You will likely see several birds strutting around the lawn. They resemble peacocks, but are a far more exquisite breed. Avoid touching the peacocks. Their feathers are coated in a deadly neurotoxin. Continuing into the gardens, be sure to stay on the path 
and not to look at the flowers, as there is a small risk they might make you blind. You will arrive at the entrance of a hedge maze, the hedges of which can be anywhere from 30 to 500 feet tall. There will be several flower boxes lining the path. At this point, a thin, moist man with black arms will emerge from behind one of the boxes. This is the Toad Man, and he will be your only chance of leaving the event. The Toad Man will ask to see your invitation, to be sure you have not arrived at the event uninvited. Give the Toad Man your hors d'oeuvre from earlier. Since he is constantly malnourished, he is easy to bribe. The Toad Man will thank you for the food and lead you into the maze. It is crucial you do not lose the Toad Man at this point, or you will become forever lost. Once you reach the center of the maze, the Toad Man will show you a small koi pond. This is the way out. Thank the Toad Man before quickly and quietly submerging yourself in the pond. You will emerge into the body of water nearest to your house. From there, you are free to walk home. After arriving back at your place, you will find the door you came through has reverted back to a normal closet. A shining silver envelope will be placed on the floor of the closet. This is a party favor from the master himself. Hang on to it, but do not open it. If you receive no envelope, run. At first, I thought I was the only one who had been to the rice property. In fact, I wasn't sure if it really happened at all. But thanks to various online forums, I was able to find others like me. Others who attended an event and lived to tell the tale. Through their collective experiences, I was able to compile this guide for any unsuspecting partygoer who finds themselves at the rice property. Now, I can hear you asking, why do I speak so lightly of the events? Events that sound anything but. It's because there is one more rule you should know. If you speak ill of your experience at the rice property, in speech or in text, the hosts will hear you. No matter where you are, and no matter how long it has been since the event you attended, they will become very upset that you have the gall to come uninvited to one of their events and spit on it afterwards. They will want to return the favor. At the next celebration you attend, they will be there. I am telling you this very quickly, because I don't know when I'll get another chance. I slipped up today. I broke the final rule. I told my wife we need to board up that closet, that I don't want my beautiful daughter accidentally ending up in such a horrible place. I know they heard me call it that. My daughter's birthday is tomorrow. She's going to be ten. We're pretty well off, so she's going to have a big party. All her friends are going to be here. It breaks my heart to know I won't be able to see my baby girl on her birthday. That I won't be able to set the cake down in front of her and smile as she blows out the candles. Not tomorrow. And not ever again. Not if I want them to show up. I won't be able to kiss my wife on her anniversary or on New Year's. I won't be able to sing Christmas songs around the sparkling, colourful tree. I live in constant fear of walking into a surprise party, of accidentally standing too close to my neighbour's house during one of his barbecues. But as long as I'm careful, as long as I keep my distance from anything that vaguely resembles a celebration, I'll be safe. The people I love will be safe. For now. If you happen to find an undocumented door in a recently purchased home, 
don't open it. Nothing grew in my garden. Even weeds scuffed at my barren rectangle of earth. All I wanted was a healthy patch of strawberries so that I could start buying oversized genetic monstrosities from Walmart. Success evaded me like a housefly on meth. I do not know what I was doing wrong. I filled my plot with bucket loads of soil. I used premium fertilizer. I consistently watered every day and there was enough direct sunlight to charbroil meat. I put in lots of sweat drenched effort and I did not have a single green sprout to show for it. I dove headfirst into the complex and fickle science of horticulture. I found gardening forums, scans of old magazines and YouTube videos that guaranteed a verdant cornucopia. I even had a long chat with the elderly ladies at the local community garden. Despite all this fantastic advice, my efforts all fell flat. It felt like my green thumb had rigor mortis and fallen off. I was growing desperate. My fragile ego was far too invested in this project and I was willing to cheat whatever form that may take. That is when I decided to use bone meal. It turns out young strawberries need phosphorus for healthy root growth and a fantastic source of phosphorus comes from ground up bones. I could easily buy bone meal at any garden supply store. However, given my pattern of repeated failure, I figured the generic store bought stuff would not be strong enough. So, I checked in with my heron supplier on the dark web. He always knows how to obtain the best product. Bone meal? No problem, he said in an encrypted message. I'll send you a fat bag of the stuff right away. Two weeks later, there was a knock at my front door. I opened it and found a UPS delivery driver huffing and puffing with an unwieldy sack on his shoulder. I brought it inside and tore it open. It was filled with a chalky white powder. Included inside was a note in Cyrillic that I did not understand. The return address said it came from Lviv. I rushed outside and completely covered my garden with the bone meal. I spread it so thick and even that it looked like winter came early. I knew the resultant growth was not going to be instant, but I still stood over my plot, eager and hopeful. The next morning, I checked on the status of my garden, and I was floored. Green leaves were already sprouting in diverse patches. Clearly, the bone meal was having an effect and in only a few short hours, I was seeing results. I consoled myself that my bad luck was finally ebbing away. Soon, I would have a bountiful assortment of sweet and succulent strawberries. I was overjoyed. Later, the same afternoon, I checked in my strawberries again. Now, they were twice as large, and many more patches had appeared. I looked closer and found the first incipient green berries making their debut. Wow, I thought to myself. I could not believe how fast they were coming in. After enjoying failure for so long, success was a welcome change. That night, I wanted to celebrate with some skip the dishes delivery, but the food never showed up. The next morning, I eagerly inspected my garden. What I found blew my expectations out of the water. My garden was not only growing, it was thriving. The strawberry bush now came up to my waist. 
The gargantuan fruit that hung from its branches looked like they belonged in Jurassic Park. I reached in and retrieved the perfect strawberry. I placed it in my mouth and chewed. Words cannot describe the ecstasy that I felt. It was not sweet, so much as sublime. It was the platonic, ideal type of what a strawberry should be. Once more, I stuck my hand into the bush to tear away another delectable morsel. When I felt a sharp, stabbing pain, I recoiled, looked at my arm, and found a crimson rivulet of blood. I examined the strawberry bush and discovered long, pointy thorns that dotted every inch of the bush's many green stems. They resembled the thorns you would find on a rose bush, but longer and more serrated. I would have to be more careful. I did not realize strawberry bushes had thorns. As I was leaving, I swore I felt an uncanny movement within the bush, like a shudder or an agitated quiver. Since there was no wind, I assumed the heat was getting to me. I dismissed it as a side effect of too much sun and not enough hydration. I checked the mailbox, but it was empty. I went back inside. That night, I still felt like celebrating. I was disappointed that Skip the Dishes did not show up, so I ordered pizza instead. Once again, no food showed up. I turned on the porch light, but my pizza never arrived. The next morning, I checked once more on my garden. The strawberry bush was now a strawberry hedge. It towered over me and extended well beyond the confines of my garden plot. Long, creeping vines snaked along the ground like invasive tentacles. I reached in for another strawberry, but stopped short. Deep within the mass of vegetation, I could make out a foreign object. I was mindful of the thorns and carefully spread back the foliage. Inside, I saw a skip the dishes bag, a cardboard pizza box, and a bundle of unopened mail. Despite the heat, I was frozen. Something was wrong. Dreadfully wrong. Maybe the skip the dishes guy, the pizza delivery person, and the mailman all came down with collective disinterest in their work. Maybe they all decided they had had enough and flung their deliverables into the bush. Maybe they were all at home perusing the classifieds for a new career. I almost convinced myself that this was the truth, until I saw, within the strawberry bush, three freshly skinned skulls being sucked into the earth. To make matters worse, the strawberries looked wrong. I grabbed a strawberry the size of a large bell pepper. I could feel it squirm in my grip as though it was filled with thousands of worms that writhed just beneath the surface of his bumpy red skin. I wanted to take a bite and savor the delicious ecstasy, but I held back. Instead, I brought it inside the kitchen. I placed the cutting board on the counter and made an incision at the top, chopping the berry in half. I recoiled in horror when I failed to find the strawberry center I expected. Instead, the insides resembled a miscarried fetus. There were slime-covered bits of flesh that appeared to be undeveloped or malformed organs. The sweet fruit juice was mixed with pulpy viscera, and there was even the beginnings of a vertebra and a spinal cord that extended up the length of the berry 
and into the stem. What have I created? I just wanted fresh strawberries. I did not want this monstrosity that was ripe with malevolent purpose. I did not want this abomination that was becoming morbidly obese with evil by feeding upon innocent couriers. It had blood on its leaves, and I, as its cultivator, had blood on my hands. I had to do something. I had to destroy this fruity hellspawn. I waited until night. I approached the bush hesitantly, a flashlight in one hand and a jerry can in the other. In the dark, I could hear the insane chattering of hundreds of grotesque berries. I directed my flashlight into the bush and found every strawberry had a miniature mouth that flexed open and closed like a frenzied piranha about to feast on a fresh carcass. In place of teeth were rows of jagged seeds, all laid out in a sinister rictus. I held up the jerry can and was greeted by a chorus of hissing fruit and fluttering leaves. The whole bush seemed to rock back and forth like it was trying to free itself from its earthy confines. A spiked tendril shot out and struck me in the face. I backed away and wiped off a swath of fresh blood. I doused the bush with a splash of gasoline and then lit the abomination on fire. There was a loud whoosh, followed by a thousand tiny screams. Soon, the bush was engulfed in a pillar of flame. Each strawberry burst with a violent pop, sending clods of seedy red innards flying in all directions. I waited until the strawberry bush was reduced to smoldering cinders. I poured water over the burnt corpse of my plant and was greeted by a prolonged hiss as the last of the fire died out. I then picked up my shovel and dug up my entire garden. I grabbed a box of kosher salt from the kitchen and salted the earth. If it was good enough for Carthage, it was good enough for me. My experiment in gardening was over. Buying plastic trays of mutant strawberries did not seem so bad anymore. I would be content for the rest of my life if my garden grew nothing but sand dunes. Gardening filled a vacuum that needed to be filled. I needed a new hobby. So, I decided to buy an aquarium and the most beautiful beta fish you have ever seen. It is difficult to mess up a fish, right? Nope. The fish grew listless and dull. He refused to nibble on the tiny pellets of fish food I sprinkled into his tank. Soon, I was growing concerned for the health of my poor beta. I needed better food. So, I checked in with my heron supplier on the dark web. He always knows how to obtain the best product. Fish food? No problem, he said in an encrypted message. I'll send you a fat bag of the stuff. Right away.